When I searched online, I found a great deal of interesting facts and information about the Philippine Church celebrating its 500 years of Christianity. Yes, other than online searches, one can learn more about the vibrant Philippine Church and its faith journey. Hi there. I'm J.D. Marr. Welcome to Shalom World's 500 YOC program in partnership with the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. In this series, we dive deep into 500 years of Christianity, its roots, journey, and fruits in the world's third largest Catholic country, the Philippines. In the 16th century, Explorer Ferdinand Magellan and his team of voyagers from Europe reached the island of Cebu to expand their spice trade. This has been marked as a milestone in the history of the country and its people. The Christian missionaries who accompanied Magellan on the Spanish ship spread the gospel in the Philippines. This time we discuss the Filipino spirituality and how it has made an impact on society. When the Spanish missionaries arrived in the Philippine island, their efforts at evangelization sought to integrate Christianity into the lives and culture of the Filipinos. This led to the kind of spirituality which Filipinos are known for, devotion to Santo Nino, to the Black Nazarene and the Blessed Virgin Mary, the novenas and fiestas in honor of patron saints and others. In recent decades, however, a different form of spirituality has taken root in the country. It's the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. This has inspired various groups of lay people to actively live out the faith. These forms of spirituality have led to the rise of various lay religious organizations and covenant communities which contribute to the transformation of Philippine society. To further discuss this, we have Monsignor Andy Valera and Raymond Cruz Jr., affectionately known as June. Monsignor Andres Valera is currently the parish priest of Santo Nino Parish and vicar foreign in Mekawayan, Bulacan. He teaches at the Graduate School of Liturgy at the University of San Beda and San Carlos Major Seminary. He has a master's in Philippine Church history and a licentiate in sacred liturgy and has written several books on liturgical rites. Raymond Daniel Cruz Jr. is a member of the Ligaya ng Panginoon Covenant Community and the current president of Sangguniang Laiko ng Pilipinas, the implementing arm of CBCP Episcopal Commission on the laity, which is linked to the various lay movements and organizations in the country. Welcome to both of you to 500 YOC. Thank you very much, and it's a privilege to be with you today. Thank you, JD. Thank you for inviting us in 500 YOC. Let's begin with Monsignor Andy. On the focus of religiosity, we, we know from episode one of 500 YOC that when the Spaniards arrived in the Philippine Islands, they encountered a people with their own distinct cultural traditions. And let's talk about those traditional cultural and ritualistic practices of the Filipino community at the time. And it would seem that they would be contrary to the Catholic faith. I'm sure that that would offer some serious challenges to the missionaries who were there to Christianize the land, wouldn't it? Yeah, at the beginning, it was some of the practices of the Filipino are contrary to the Catholic faith. One of the main problems by the Spaniards they would always complain about drunkenness, which is being used also for the ritual practices. And they want to eliminate this in society. The other one problem, of course, is the so-called ancestor worship or the spirit worship that they had encountered. In one account, they would even say that the Filipinos, every time their relative would die, they will put a stick of a small idol and in this one house, they have 200 of these. And also they encountered what is called slavery. It's a form of dependency. It's quite different from 
the slavery that came from Africa. And at the beginning, the missionaries were not aware of this. But they, later on, they were aware that there is this type of dependency, which is a, a form of slavery. And hence, they also have problem with this. And then uh, the other one that they had encountered is the idea of usury, which is uh, very prevalent at that time, which leads, by the way, to slavery. In spite of that, they tried to gain people's confidence and they found out a cultural entry. And that is the Filipinos would always follow the Datus. So if they converted the leader, they convert the whole tribe as it were. So they try to talk first to the leader, then when the leader is converted, when the leader would remove his anito, and then the people would follow. Let's pinpoint that a little bit more. Let's, let's talk about the aspects of the pre-Hispanic Filipino culture. What part of their culture were the missionaries able to capitalize on and, and to use those things as tools for spreading the faith? One of the things that in the Filipino belief is the so-called bathala. And it is a belief on the supreme being. So in spite of all these small spirits and anitos that they believe, they believe in a supreme being. So that is one of the entries that they had. It is the monotheistic religion that we have that they were able to capitalize. The other one, of course, is the so-called, which was used, by the way, in the time of Pope Gregory the Great, when he sent St. Augustine to England, the so-called substitution. Substitution of Christian practices with, uh, against the so-called pagan practices. And the missionaries use this a lot, especially with regards to the respect that we have with images, different saints, and even of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is one of their main entry. The other one later on that would come was they will establish schools for boys or at least children because they realized that it is easier to teach the children than the adults. So they would capitalize on this also, but it was later. Then we see the missionaries bring in the icons, the Santo Nino, the Black Nazarene, these religious icons. How did these now contribute to the impact and the acceptance of devotion to enliven the Catholic faith? In the account itself of the so-called Las Conquistas de las Islas Filipinas by the Augustinian friars, it, this is the second arrival of uh, the Spaniards here after Magellan, they found the Santo Nino in this so-called uh, cradle, the translation of Paris, a cradle, sometimes it's a box, but it is being honored in this house with flowers and devoutedly being taken care of. So in fact, this was a gift to the first, to the wife of the Datu on her baptismal day. She was made to select, and apparently, she's, instead of selecting necklace and all other things, she selected the image of Santo Nino. So when the Spaniards came back, they were all surprised by this. Apparently, they knew that the Filipinos would honor this small Santo Nino, and hence, they would use picture. The word used in Tagalog is Larawan, and one of the images are the icons, of course, especially when you will notice that the black Nazarene is more or less the color of the, we are not blacks, we are brown a little bit, but the color is not white. So the Filipinos would have these images. Also, the other one is the oldest image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Nuestra Señora de la Guía. All of these are so-called black icons, and hence, they would have affinity with the Filipinos. The other one that was mentioned by the prior in using icons is a picture of hell. Because the Filipinos apparently believe in afterlife. And hence, to teach them about the effect of biases, etc., and how they will suffer in hell. And the prior said this was very effective. They would use this picture maybe of uh, that's what they said of hell 
And the natives after that would say they want to be baptized. And now a different form of spirituality has taken root in the Philippines in the form of renewal movements. So now we kind of transition uh, Raymond Cruz, June, and the uh, opportunity for you to talk about these devotions. So give us some insight on the Catholic charismatic renewal created as a revival of faith in many countries and of course in the Philippines. Um, talk to us about its beginnings, its contributions to the church, please. It was something new as we speak of renewal, something new that in a interested people, that something new that made them understand that there's more to our faith. And uh, th that began a new kind of excitement among the lay people, understanding that the, the faith that they have, which is very rich, is now being renewed, but this time by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think that's the word, the renewal in the power of the Holy Spirit. When people started to realize that the faith that they have can be renewed through a personal relationship with Jesus and a, 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 an experiential uh, faith that can be lived in a day-to-day -day way, it, beca it became so exciting that people wanted to share that new uh, found uh, religiosity. Are you looking for life-changing entertainment? Does what you see on most channels leave you feeling unfulfilled? Well, look no further. Shalom World TV brings the peace and joy of Jesus Christ to you, whether at home or on the go. To start watching, you don't need antennas, cable connections, or a dish. You probably already have what you need, if you have a smart TV, such as a Samsung, LG, or Panasonic, or if you have them with an Android, Opera, or Roku TV operating system. These can be found on the latest models of Sony, Toshiba, Vizio, Philips, RCA, Sharp Aquos, TCL, Insignia, Element, Hitachi, Vestal, Skyworth, Chang Hong, Konka, and Hisense. You can also watch Shalom TV on most IPTV streaming devices, starting with the fourth generation of Apple TV and Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Mi Box, Amino, Humax, or on TiVo Box through the Opera TV store. Are you a gamer or virtual reality enthusiast? We've got you covered. Shalom World is on Xbox One, Razer Forge, Nvidia Shield, and HoloLens. To start watching, all you have to do is go to the App Store, download Shalom World, and start being fulfilled by content that brings you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. For more information on how to watch Shalom World on your TVs and devices, visit us at shalomworld.org slash connected TV. Have a smartphone or tablet? Take Shalom with you wherever you go. Again, by downloading Shalom World from the App Store. If you prefer to watch from your Mac or PC, get the Shalom World desktop app. Or you can always watch from our website, shalomworld.org. And guess what? Shalom World is absolutely free on all of these platforms. Yes, free. There are no download charges and no in-store app purchases required, ever. If you're looking for life-changing entertainment, you found it. It's here, waiting for you, on your Shalom World. June, you yourself, you're a, you're a member of a covenant community. It takes its inspiration from the charismatic renewal. Talk to us about uh, the Ligaya Nong, the Pangni Nong covenant community that you're a part of. Yes, it's Ligaya ng Panginoon, the joy of the Lord. It's the joy of the Lord. And I, I am I'm privileged uh, being part of this joy of the Lord because the one who founded the joy of the Lord is also considered as the pioneer in the charismatic renewal movement, Father Herbert Schneider, when he and a, a group of other lay people founded the Ligaya ng Panginoon back in the 1970s. It's good that I, I am still in contact with these people and I can always hear the history, the people behind and the work of the Holy Spirit while building up the, the charismatic renewal in the Philippines. And during that time, it was more of the, the sprouting of many prayer groups uh, being formed uh, in one parish and another. And people would be like uh, 
they call it charismatic butterflies, trying to go to different prayer meetings, trying to uh, uh, absorb as much as they could in, because they're so thirsty. But eventually, the, the idea of having a covenant community came in, much uh, an inspiration from, from the, uh, the Sword of the Spirit and uh, a lot of other charismatic communities from, from uh, the U.S. and in, in Europe. And it is something that has been studied by the uh, members of the, the Joy of the Lord community. And we were very, very fortunate to have met uh, people who were also the pioneers of the Covenant community, Steve Clark, uh, Bruce Yocum, and a, a lot of other people who went to the Philippines and spent their time teaching the community how to become one. I can tell, I can feel your energy and enthusiasm coming right through the camera. And I was gonna say, you're, you're moving up to 50 years, that's wonderful. But let's get into the Marian devotion now. Uh, the Marian devotion, it's another great pillar of strength in the Philippine church, we know that. Filipinos are often quite affectionately called a people in love with Mary, the Flores de Mayo. It's just one among the many Marian devotions. But uh, what are some other Marian devotions that are widely practiced and how have they evolved and deepened the, the faith journey of the people in the Philippines? One of the most popular Marian devotion in the Philippines is the Novena to the Perpetual Hell, introduced to us by the Redemptorist Fathers. And until now, every Wednesday in the Philippines, the churches are full. They would attend the Novena and then later on attend the Masses on Wednesdays. So the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary helped us a lot in this. And we were thankful because the Redemptorists were able to update the Novena in a sense that it would explain the faith, in a sense that there will be litany also for the different liturgical times of the year instead of just one litany. And this Dubina you will find all over the place. Also, sometimes it will depend on the region of the country. For example, in Bicol, they would always have a big devotion to the Our Lady of Peña Francia. And they would call her Ina, just that, mother. And every face of the Peña Francia, wherever the Biconanos are, they would go back to this place to pay homage to the Ina, to the mother. So this is a, uh, a regional devotion that the Filipinos would express. And then besides that, of course, is what you mentioned, the popular May devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and also the praying of the Rosary. In the previous parish where I was, the youth there had a bow, and they would fulfill this every first Saturday. They would begin after the mass at seven o'clock, which is around eight, seven forty-five, and they would pray two thousand Hail Marys, one after the other, until the in the evening. And these are not old people; these are young people who made a bow to the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray that. 2,000 Hail Mary. So you see this devotion that you have and you bring in these people and even the young people. So it's truly leading that next generation. So, I mean, we're all not gonna be here forever. So we have to leave that, that those gifts to the next generation. And it's, I guess it starts, as you say, right in the home. But now you're the current president of Sangunian, like Kong Um, uh, Pilipinas. Give me your assessment of uh, the active involvement of the lay faithful now in the church today through your lens as the president of that organization? For many years, the uh, late in the Philippines has been uh, called the, the sleeping giant because indeed, indeed, uh, it's a huge force uh, that, that has uh, been uh, in a way uh, slumbering for quite a while. But you know, especially through the charismatic renewal, people began to see their giftedness. Okay? People began to see the, the, the ministries that are available for them to work in. And also there has been a certain empowering given by the church. Our pastors, our clergy, our bishops, understanding the work of the Holy Spirit and understanding the role of the laity in this transformation of the, the temporal order really empowered the lay people to move okay? and to do the work that has to be done in the temporal society. So I would say now that much of the charismatic and even a, and proud that many, many communities, many communities now working in the different uh, segments of our uh, parish life, 
whether it's a parish pastoral council, whether it's a diocesan council, whether it's the commission, many of them have an experience of the new life in Christ, an experience of the Holy Spirit transforming them, and their service is really a love offering. It became easier for us to even sacrifice because we knew that there's a power within being given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, you've mentioned uh, this 47-year-plus history. We, we see a rise in different renewal communities and lay organizations. But give me your perspective now. Do you honestly see a, a true active participation in church ministries? Do you see it flourishing even more? We see authentic faith being lived out by people. We see love for scriptures, something that's very new to us when we were beginning the charismatic renewal. We, we don't even know where to get those scripture passages we've been hearing. There's vibrant worship happening, whether in the church or outside the church. There is practical Christian living among people. People are able to live out their Christianity, even while they're, you see people praying in canteens before they, they, they eat their, their lunches. You see people organizations praying before their board meetings. And you see a very rich community life experience. If that is not a change in the society, then what else is there to see? We see uh, structures and systems slowly being influenced by, by discipline, transparency, hopefully by honesty in our country. And we are very, very hopeful. Well put, well put. Uh, the Holy Spirit is working here, let me tell you. Monsignor, I'll start with you as we conclude, as we close our discussion. So my question to you, my final question would be this. How can these popular devotions that you so eloquently spoke of help further the fruits and blessings of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines? What would you say? I think one of the main factors of the popular devotion in the Philippines is that it is evolving in a sense that, for example, the old Dubinas now had been revised and scriptural reading are now in place. That's why. So you teach also the people about sacred scripture and not just plain popular devotion. The second aspect is now the popular devotion leads people to what is so-called uh, social apostolate, which was formerly not part of the popular devotion. What is the purpose of popular devotion? First, it should lead us to the Eucharist. The second is, it should prolong our experience of our participation in the Eucharist. And this, I think, is what the popular devotion is uh, doing right now. So this popular religiosity that the people had would lead them more to participating in the Eucharist and also opening up the sacred scripture. Thank you, Monsignor Andy. And June, uh, you get the final word on the same question, but uh, to your point of discussion on this uh, 500 YOC episode, in relation to the Lagaya movement uh, and other renewal communities, how can those movements further the fruits and blessings of the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines? What would you say? Together with the popular devotions, which has truly blessed us through the years, we need to continue to promote the culture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That we need to really say that there's power in really sharing the life in Christ that we receive through the power of the Holy Spirit, thereby making us missionary disciples. And that is the goal of the 500 YOC, that eventually the Philippines will become a truly sending church, a truly sending church, that we go out and become missionary disciples, not forgetting that there is a need for us to transform our society and really work for the transformation of the social order, especially during this time of our election, and even after that to change the political system, the economic system, and really work towards the solidarity of peoples in the line of, of Pratelli Tutti, a challenge and an encouragement. Well, you've both have put it together so, uh, so well. I really appreciate it. We've learned a lot about the dynamics of religiosity, spirituality, and of course, uh, the renewal movement. So thank you, Monsignor Andy Valera. Thank you. Raymond Cruz, thank you for joining us so much. Thank you, J.D. 
Join us again for the next episode to learn more about the happenings of 500 YOC. Don't forget to download the free Shalom World app to watch this series, get more updates on 500 years of celebrations in the Philippines, and many more amazing shows. I'm J.D. Marr. Mabuhay. My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.